Okay, so we're going to talk today about the Java fork join pool framework. And uh, after watching this part of the lesson, you'll understand how it works in general, kind of what the computation model is. You'll understand the structure and functionality of the fork join framework. And you'll also know how it's implemented internally. So let's first talk a little bit about the computation model. So what it's trying to do is it's trying to provide you a high performance parallel fine grain, really data parallelism execution framework, or they call it task execution framework, but it's really about data parallelism for Java programs. And this engine that Fork Join Pool provides is usable in a number of ways. And I recommend you take a look at this interview with Doug Lee, who's the author of this. It's, a, it's both a transcript and also a, a podcast, and he gives some good explanations of what's the intent of this whole thing. And the fork join framework can either be programmed in its own right, you can program to it directly, as you'll be doing in one of the forthcoming assignments, assignment 4A. It's also used as the basis for parallel streams and completable futures by default. And then lots of other things use fork join framework as well. So if you take a look at stuff like uh, you know, Kotlin or uh, other, other toolkits for programming, uh, things like Akka and probably any JVM language that does parallel computing, you will find the fork join framework is being used at the heart of all that. And that was the intent, was to provide this very nice reusable infrastructure that lots of other toolkits could apply. The programming model that it supports, of course, is one that solves problems by divide and conquer. So you chop up things up into pieces. And here's the general way of doing this. You're trying to solve the overall problem. And if the problem is pretty small, you'll just solve it directly because there's no sense in wasting time doing things concurrently and in parallel if it's just a few elements long. Otherwise, you split the problem up into pieces. You fork a bunch of subtasks to solve each of the parts that you broke up. You join everything together, and then you get a final result by composing all the various sub-results. That should look pretty familiar to you at this point. That's divide and conquer. And we'll see that there's a whole bunch of different variations of how that can work. Here's a little bit more detail how it works. We take a big task, some source of data, and we partition it up into subtasks. And to do that, you fork things. And we'll talk more about fork in detail. I'll show you how it works under the hood. Uh, obviously, you don't fork past a certain point. You stop splitting up when you reach a certain level of, of granularity. You then go ahead and take all the subtasks that you created by forking, and you run those things concurrently. And this concurrent execution is, is implemented by a coordinated effort between the fork join framework, the Java execution environment, which could be the virtual machine or some ahead of time compiled infrastructure like Android Art, the operating system and its thread abstractions, and of course, ultimately the hardware cores. They're the things that really eventually do the work. Everything else are just layers of abstraction to try to make it easier to program and figure out how to use the hardware more effectively. The subtasks can execute a couple different ways. They could, they could run in parallel on the different cores. If you had a multi-core machine, then the subtasks could be mapped to those cores. Of course, if you don't have a multi-core machine, then you can have a pool of threads, and they will take turns executing on a single core. Once again, it's not really your job to keep track of that. It's the fork join framework and all the other layers of infrastructure on the platform that do that stuff for you. At some point, after everything's been set into motion, then your program can't make any more progress till the subparts are done. So you wait for them to complete. And the way you do that is by using something called join. And join is used to wait for subtasks to finish or for a subtask to finish. We'll show a little bit later that in the fork join framework, join also does some other things as well. So uh, it's going to be a little different than a join with a, a Java thread. For example, Java thread join just typically blocks and waits for something to finish, some other thread to finish. With fork join framework, because of the way it's implemented as a framework atop a pool of worker threads, in that case, the join method has some additional things it can do. It can actually play a role in executing subtasks. And I'll show you some examples of that. As joins complete, they get merged together. And then you typically end up with a final join that pulls all the pieces together. And that will give you back your final result. So you'll get a chance to play around with that. And I'll show you a whole bunch of examples here shortly. Not every 
use of fork join framework actually has to have subtasks that return results. You can actually have subtasks that don't return a result. They get the result some other way, and I'll show you an example of that. And you'll see that the way that the fork join framework is structured, there are different classes that handle subtasks that return results through return values versus those that don't. So we have recursive task, which returns its subresults through a return value, and something called recursive action, which does not, doesn't have a return value. So speaking about the structure of the fork join framework, let's talk a little bit about how that's designed and what it does under the hood. So fork join pool is an executor service implementation. And if you stick around and take the class in the spring, we'll talk more about what the executor service is. It's a very interesting bunch of interfaces and abstract classes and concrete classes that give you a wide range of different ways to handle the execution of concurrent tasks in Java. And it came around, a lot of this came around in Java, JDK 5, Java 5, and then some other stuff was added later. So you had these, these sort of core interfaces, the executor and executor service are kind of the, the building blocks of everything. There's an abstract class that provides default implementations for lots of things. And some implementations of this will be used to execute runnables and or callables. You're probably familiar with runnables because that's what you use to run a thread, right? You say, you make a new runnable or you make a Lambda expression that's a runnable. Callables are also things that return values. They're very simple. So thread pool executor can be used to run, execute runnables or callables and in a pool of threads. Scheduled thread pool executor does this based on the passage of time and so on and so forth. We're not going to talk much about those things here. In contrast, as you might expect, fork join pool executes fork join tasks. It can also execute runnables and callables, but that's really not its purpose. It doesn't do much good. I would not use uh, it, the fork join pool to do runnables and callables because it does fork join tasks, which we'll talk more about in a second. The fork join pool defines a bunch of methods that allow non-fork join task clients to process fork join tasks. That may not make a whole lot of sense at first, but when we get into the implementation structure, you'll understand why there's a distinction between the non-fork join task clients and the fork join task clients. And it has a big impact on how things work under the hood. We'll discuss these methods a little bit later. The, the methods here are execute, invoke, and submit. Uh, all my examples that I show coming up here use invoke, and invoke basically takes a fork join task instance and performs what it's trying to do, and it blocks until the result is finished and it gets the result back. So that's what invoke does. Uh, execute just asynchronously executes something, doesn't have a result, and submit takes a fork join task and will submit it to the fork join pool for execution, and it gets a future back as the result. And we'll see later a fork join task is, is basically a future. Now, here's kind of what things look like under the hood for non-fork join task clients. So if someone comes along and says submit or invoke or execute, whatever, they put their fork join task into what's called a shared queue. And then there's a pool of threads, the fork join pool, as you might imagine. And those things will then pull off the uh, fork join tasks from the fork join shared queue. And then they go ahead and process the work on something that's called an unshared queue. And, and in fact, it's not really the right, it's kind of a misnomer in a way because it's, it's owned by the thread, but other threads, as we'll see, can come along and steal stuff from it. So it's not entirely unshared. It's just not shared in quite the same way that this thing is shared. Um, okay, so we'll see that that's kind of the way that work gets into the fork join pool to start with, typically, at the, at the outermost levels. The goal of this whole thing, the goal of doing things the way we're going to be describing, is to maximize processor core utilization. So if you want to hear more about the motivation behind this and where the world is headed and so on, uh, or is already there in many cases, I recommend you take a listen to this podcast by Doug Lee, where he talks about kind of modern processor core, multi-core style programming. It's a few years old, but it's still quite relevant. And he 
makes the point there that the whole purpose of stuff like the fork joint pool is to try to maximize the processor utilization. We want the thing to be running at full tilt as much as possible because, of course, that will increase your performance. So that's a good place to go to learn more about sort of the motivation behind this. Okay, so that kind of explains what the fork join pool is. It's kind of a facade, if you will, for the fork join tasks. So what's a fork join task? Well, a fork join task is basically an association of a chunk of data along with some computations on that data. And it's useful because it enables very fine-grained parallelism. And uh, as we'll see, it, it can be used to handle very large numbers of, of tasks. And you can take a look at this link, which is a presentation by Brian Getz, who's one of the Java architects who talks a lot about concurrency. And he talks about data parallelism in Java and the fork join pool. As I think I may have mentioned before, a fork join task is lighter weight than a Java thread. So what does that mean? It just means that a Java thread, a real thread, has its own stack, it has its own registers, it's got a lot of other resources that allow it to be scheduled independently on an underlying core and managed by the thread scheduler that the operating system has internally. In contrast, as you can see by the picture, the fork join task is much lighter weight. It doesn't have its own runtime stack. It's, it's very, it's multiplexed essentially. And the good thing about that is you can have a very large number, you know, maybe thousands or more of the fork join tasks in a process. And they're going to run on a much smaller number of so-called worker threads, which are these guys down here. So you have lots of fork join tasks that run on a smaller number, usually a much smaller number of worker threads in the fork join pool. And the number of threads in the fork join pool, the number of worker threads, is typically a function of the number of cores. So each worker thread is, in fact, a Java thread object with all the full accoutrements that you would expect from a normal thread. There are two key methods in a fork join task. There's other methods there as well, of course, doing other things under the hood. But these are the ones that are most important from a programming point of view. And these methods are used to control parallel processing and merging of the results. And they're, of course, fork and join. So fork arranges to asynchronously execute this task in the appropriate thread pool. We'll talk about different thread pools shortly. Uh, so you can think of fork as basically a lightweight, ver you can think of fork, calling fork, as a lightweight version of thread.start. So it doesn't create a Java worker thread, at least not directly, there may be some indirect stuff, but it will basically be run on a Java thread. And what happens is it doesn't start to run immediately, but instead, it places the task, or the subtask, whatever you want to think about this thing is, it'll place the subtask onto a work queue, and it actually puts it at the head of the work queue. And we'll talk more about what the work queue is in just a minute. Okay, so that's kind of what fork is doing. So you can fork things off, and, and very commonly you'll have a parent task that forks off one or more child tasks to go and arrange to be run at some point. And we'll talk more about how that works shortly. Join is the other half of this, and it returns the result of the computation when the task or the subtask has been finished uh, being processed in the pool. Now, join in fork join pool world is a little different from classic Java thread join. So if you remember Java thread join, we talked about it briefly earlier. It's basically used as a simple form of a barrier synchronizer to wait for another thread to finish, and then you join with it. And so you can't proceed until the other one's done. A join call in, in regular threads really just sort of blocks the calling thread. The fork join task join, however, doesn't simply block the calling thread. Instead, what it'll do is uh, it's used by a worker thread to help run other tasks. So when you join with a, uh, when, when the join is encountered by the worker thread, it will say, aha, I'm going to start processing results or continue processing results. And I'm going to not return to the caller until this subtask's results are finished. In other words, when that join is done. 
So the thing to remember is join in a fork join task does not block per se. It simply enqueues the fact that it wants to be, it wants the computation to continue only after its subtask that you call join on has actually finished. The target subtask is actually done. And it's the worker threads that will fin figure this out. So you can think essentially of the fork join task as being multiplexed over the pool of worker threads. And these calls like fork and join are really calls that are arranged to have those computations executed properly. Programs very rarely use the fork join class directly. You almost never implement it directly. Oh, there's some, some things you can do with it, but you don't usually um, subclass directly from fork join task. Instead, you typically will extend one of its subclasses and override their compute hook method. So let's take a look at the different subclasses. So one subclass is called recursive action. And that's used for computations that do not return results. And you can see that because you can see it returns void, which is like doesn't return anything, really. Recursive task, in contrast, does return a result. And it returns a result of type v, whatever the generic parameter was given when you instantiated this task. So that's going to be used to get results back, and those things will get merged together in some way. And there's something else called the counted completer, and that's used for computations in which completed actions trigger other actions. And this is a lot more complicated. We're not going to program directly with it here. I'll just note that this is used very heavily in the implementation of the uh, parallel streams and computable futures parts of, of Java. So one sort of sad, interesting quirk is that recursive action, recursive task, and counted completer do not extend some common functional interface. So as a result, you can't use lambda expressions to implement their compute methods, which means your code is a little bit more verbose than would otherwise be the case if, in fact, this thing was derived or implemented from a common functional interface. And the reason for this is historical. They, they developed the Java fork join pool back in Java 7 before they had lambdas. So of course, they didn't think of having a functional interface because there was no such thing as a functional interface in those days. And they just haven't gone back and retrofit everything to, to do that yet, which is kind of a shame. Arturo. Who maintains the Java source code? So there's uh, the Java community process. The JCP is a group of companies and individuals that have stewardship of the Java, the Java platform. And nominally, Oracle is sort of the, um, you know, the main steward, like the steward of Gondor. It's the steward of the, uh, the Java community process. And so that's where you would go to find the, the key architects or largely people from Oracle. So Oracle's primarily responsible, but there are other people who are involved. For example, Doug Lee is a professor at State University of New York Oswego camp campus, and he's done most of the concurrency stuff uh, and is very influential in that community. All right, let's talk a little bit about the internals of how things work under the hood. So we've talked about these worker threads, right? Those are the actual Java threads. And each worker thread in a fork join pool, and by the way, you can have multiple fork join pools if you want, or you can use the common one, maintain their own double-ended queue, which is also known as a DEC, which is typically spelled D-E-Q-U-E, DEC, but it's pronounced like, like the deck of a ship. The fork join framework implements this DEC via a class that's called the work, actually, I think it might be worker queue. I'll have to double check that. If you go and look at the uh, source code here, if you click on this link, It'll take you to the source code, and you can go see the, the worker queue. I'll have to double check that. Maybe it's work queue. Who knows? Um, anyway, whichever it's worker queue or work queue, here's how it works. So whenever a uh, subtask is forked in a task, that forked subtask will be arranged to be run, which just means it's pushed. The subtask is pushed onto the head of that worker's own deck. So here's an example where we fork, and then a subtask is pushed onto the work queue deck of that thread. 
So remember I showed you before how external clients can submit or execute or invoke fork join tasks, and those things go onto a shared queue, and then that shared queue will be used to feed these worker threads, and then they will end up basically pushing those tasks onto their thread-specific work queues. And you can read this paper by Doug Lee to get a, another nice overview of this. This paper is a little old, so some of the things in there aren't exactly the names that they ended up with when Java was all said and done, but you can see a, a good mapping between what he talks about and what is in the source code. So, um, I should say a worker thread. <laughs> a worker thread processes it, processes its own deck, this thing, in LIFO order. Remember, LIFO order is last in, first out. It's like a stack. Um, and it basically pops subtasks from the front of its own deck. So when a worker thread doesn't have anything else to do, when it's, quote, idle, it'll then go and say, hey, is there anything in my queue that I, I need to process? In my deck, rather? And if so, it'll take it off the front. And the reason for doing it in that order, to, so you push and pop off the front, is to enhance locality of reference and improve cache performance. Now, remember how we talked about how uh, typically when you work with, with fork join stuff, this includes parallel streams, you typically start with the whole data set first, and then you split it in half, and then you split that in half, and you split that in half. So if you think about what's happening, when things are being pushed onto the work queue, the bigger items are typically towards the bottom of the queue slash stack, and the smaller items are towards the top, right? Because if you're subdividing things, you know, let's say you have a big thing and you break it into two parts, and you stick both those bigger parts onto the deck, you, you push them, and then you go ahead and will work on the next chunk, and you push them. So you'll end up with the biggest items being at the bottom and the smallest items being at the top. Remember that when we talk about work stealing here in a second. Okay, so that's, that's what it does. It, pushes and pops at the front. And as we'll see a little bit later when we talk about the way this actually implemented under the hood, this also allows very efficient um, locking. It's not even really locking, it's called weight-free locks to be able to guard the queues to minimize the overhead. Now, if it turns out that a, a thread is idle, right, it's, it's got nothing in its queue, right? So we, we saw here, um, take a look here, we saw that we now have a work queue that's empty. If we're a thread and we don't have anything else to do, we will go and steal, try to steal, a subtask from the end of some other work queue that's selected randomly. Why do we select randomly? What's the motivation for selecting the threads to steal? Arturo. Wendy. You don't try to steal the same one. What, and, and why would you not want to try to steal the same one? It's not efficient, but what's the thing we're trying to worry about? If they both went for the same lock. Sri? Right. The reason why it does it randomly is to try to spread, much like, like, much like hashing, right? A good hash function would randomly spread out the values throughout the hash table. So the same thing is true here. If we have a bunch of worker threads, we try to kind of randomly figure, or try to randomly steal from them so that we don't keep going to the same one each time, as you guys point out, and then end up contending for that guy's lock. Because the way it's gonna work here, if you end up going to random threads and you spread it out nicely, there shouldn't be much contention because each one's going to go to some other random thread. And that way, there's very rarely a situation where two threads, two worker threads, try to steal from the same work queue at the same time. So therefore, there's no lock contention. So the idea here is we try to steal things from the tail of busy threads decks. And you can read more about that here. Now, as I said, this is done uh, randomly to try to lower contention. And the tasks are stolen in FIFO order. 
And the reason for doing this is that the older stolen tasks, the ones that are at the end here, may have larger units of work. Remember we talked about before how when you push a bunch of things in that you're subdividing, breaking things up in half each time, the bigger, the quote, bigger chunks will be at the end and the smaller chunks will be at the front. And therefore, when something's stolen, it's most likely going to be a bigger thing. And therefore, that allows you to be able to take that bigger thing and then start recursively decomposing it in another thread of control. So the idea here is you're trying to have your threads initially work on big things and then split them down to smaller things. And that does a better job of partitioning stuff up into sub-pieces and helps to get a better, more balanced tree of processing by the various threads in the pool. All right, now the work queue that, or the deck that implements the work stealing is very carefully designed to minimize locking contention. Let's take a look at how this works. Uh, you can read this paper here if you want to see the actual, or see a description of the algorithm that's very influential in the fork uh, join pool, fork join pool worker thread deck implementation. So here's, this is a picture from Doug Lee's paper, and let's take a look. So these things are threads, you can see the three threads, and we're pushing, popping, and stealing, right? Um, push and pop, these operations, are only called by the owning worker thread. So a worker thread will push and pop things on its own deck, and it always does it at the, the front or the top of the deck. And because of this, because of the fact that it's always the worker thread itself on its own queue, it's able to use super high efficient so-called weight-free compare and swap or CAS operations. You'll see the acronym CAS used a lot here. And uh, I'll say a few things about CAS very briefly, but if you want to know more about CASing, we'll talk about that next semester. So what CASing does, CASing is a hardware level way of checking the value of some, uh, atomically checking the value of something in, in memory or in a register or whatnot, some atomic thing. And if that thing equals a certain value, then it gives you one result. If it equals a different value, it sets the value to what you want and returns the old result. And so you can use this, essentially, it's like a test and, it's like a souped up test and set operation that can be used to check to see whether or not an item is locked. And it never blocks. So it just sits there and it checks the value to see if it's locked or not. And because there's going to be unbelievably low contention for adding and removing things from a deck, casing is going to work well. Um, and so, because there's very low contention. The one thing we do have to watch out for is when you end up with no items in the deck, then in that case, you need to actually protect it because something else could be stealing it at the same time or trying to steal it at the same time. So things that are done to push and pop onto the deck are really fast and they have very, very lightweight locking. And if you go look at the code, you'll see what they do. It's a very low level operation, but it's very efficient. Pole may be called from a different thread. So when we call pole, that's because the other thread has been randomly assigned to try to steal something from the end of this deck, right, in, in FIFO order. And it will be called from a different thread. So remember, push and pop are called from the same thread always pole may be called from another thread, most likely will be called from another thread. And as a result, it may not always be weight free. And if you read the source code and if you read the implementation overview comments in the fork join pool, it explains in very great detail how all this stuff works. And if you look at the code, you'll see that in some cases, for various reasons, it has to actually yield. So it's, it's not really entirely weight free because it has to kind of yield the processor and come back and try again later. So it's Stealing is pretty fast. It, it has low contention amortized, but on any given call, it may not be as fast as pushing and popping with a cast. That's kind of how things work under the hood. The, the long and the short of it is, as long as you've got work to do and cores to do it on, the fork join pool implementation is going to be super efficient, and it'll try its best to balance all the processing over all the different cores on the machine. Okay, so that is the end of the over.